Thank you. I'd like to introduce Nick Brown from Ingram, please. Hey, everybody. I am acutely aware that I'm between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep things exciting. <laughs> uh, show some, some good demos and things. Um, so as Peter said, uh, my name is Nick Brown, and I'm from Vital Source. We're a part of uh, Ingram Content Group. I'm a director of product management there. And for anyone that doesn't know Vital Source, which is, I'm guessing, many or most of you, um, we're the lar world's largest digital textbook platform. Um, so last year, we served up about 2 billion textbook pages to millions of students around the globe. And we're really, really proud of that fact. Um, at Vital Source, we're also big believers in open standards and the open web platform and the capabilities of those technologies to take us beyond just delivering PDF-based textbooks to our students, which are really, in my opinion, no better than print under glass. And it's a really poor use of that technology. Um, so what I'm, I'm here to talk about today is what we think the path forward from print under glass looks like um, and what we see coming next for digital learning content of, of all stripes. Um, one of my favorite thinkers about digital learning is Seymour Papert. He unfortunately recently passed away, but um, Seymour was the inventor of the Logo programming language, which you may be familiar with. Um, and I also can't recommend more highly his book, Mindstorms, about how children and, and learners of all types engage with media and engage with technology to learn. Um, and here I've got a quote from that, that book that I really think uh, hits the nail on the head. Um, when it comes to education technology, we're really taking our new technology possibilities, things like um, cloud-based delivery into mobile platforms and that kind of thing, and applying them to old instructional ideas and instructional methods, like the thousand-page textbook that someone plops on your desk and says, here's everything you need to know. All right, so we're not really taking advantage of the technology to do what we can do in terms of educating students and educating learners. Um, we're, we're really just applying it to the, those old paradigms. Um, and the sad thing here is that Pepper wrote this quote in 1980, right? It's almost 40 years later, and I think we're still largely at that same place. Um, so, you know, how can we change that? Um, one of the common themes that we see at Vital Source are arising from uh, a lot of different folks that we talk to, be they publishers or institutions or other education technology providers, um, is a need for content to really burst out of its bindings, right? And to take that thousand page textbook and deliver it in a myriad of different user experiences and contexts and in much more granular kind of mind sized chunks that a student can wrap their head around. Um, we also see all sorts of new and interesting capabilities coming up in mobile, um, mobile platforms and in the web browser that open up all sorts of new learning experiences that we can power. Um, you know, so that may be new browser APIs that power new uh, input capabilities or, or learning modalities. That may be a broader support for rich media, audio, video, um, and that may be um, all sorts of interesting student-centric tools and services that are out there available to integrate with. Um, so it's time for us all to kind of recalibrate our mental image of the, the textbook and think outside the textbook. So what I have to show today is a, a bunch of demos and experiments um, focused on really two different categories of exploration that we're working on. Uh, on the one hand, I've got a bunch of examples of books, right, uh, you know, fun chunks of content um, that we put together that try and stretch the limits of the book. Um, so we've got some, some fun things to show there. Uh, and then on the other hand, we've worked hard to take our technology and really make it modular and interchangeable and let you plug and play that content once you've made it into whatever user experience you'd like. So I'll show you some technology on that side of things to let you remix, reuse, and redistribute content in a really flexible way that we think can power some new, um, new ways for students to learn. So let's begin with the student. Um, you know, how can we deliver that interconnected, interactive, engaging content? Um, I was a music major in college. Uh, and you know, one of the things that always frustrated me is if you're reading your paper music textbook and you can't listen along, you know, that's, that's kind of you know, strike one. So you know, that's really simple to do, um, and we can start there. It's, it's as easy as adding in that audio file to any website or book so that as I read the score, I can kind of follow along. And then using JavaScript, which today's modern book technology can, can power, that score can actually sync up exactly where it is with the audio file. So as it progresses, 
you know, you can see that that stay in sync all the way throughout. Um, that's the kind of you know subtle thing that you can add in using today's you know open web platform that makes it a much more engaging experience than simply throwing in a link to a YouTube video. Um, you know, so speaking of video, you know, obviously we're not just talking about uh, audio capabilities in in this platform. We can play video as well. So let's take a look at the uh, San Francisco Orchestra playing this same piece. And again, we've kept that in sync across all of these three different modes, the audio and the video and the score. Um, worth noting that the score is actually, uh, crazy enough, a PDF embedded inside of an EPUB 3 being rendered out using a, a fun technology called PDF.js from uh, Mozilla. So let's pause this quickly. Um, and you know, it, it's not just uh, about playback, right? There's a lot that we can do to make this engaging and interactive for the student. Um, so what I have here is a little activity that lets me tap at the tempo that I'd like my orchestra to play back at, right? So when I tap on this button, you're gonna hear that orchestra slow down or speed up with how quickly I'm tapping so that I can kind of explore the, that piece at my own speed. So let's, let's look at that. So I can slow down. and maybe go back to that score and explore a really rich and interesting part of the piece. Or maybe I just want to do it as fast as I can. So fun way to, to give a, the user a little bit of input capability there. And I'll pause that one more time. Um, and we can even go a, a step further than that. So, Today, most modern mobile browsers, um, like mobile Safari or Chrome, will expose device motion APIs to the browser. Um, so you can detect things like uh, position and accelerometer data as someone's holding their phone. So using that data, I can actually physically conduct that orchestra with my phone as the baton. So let, let's take a look at that. Um, I think it's really cool. So here I'll hit this use remote baton button Got my phone here, and as I wave this around, we should hear the orchestra play. Again, I can slow down. Or speed up. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's really, really fun. Uh, you gotta try this. Um, I wish I'd had this when I was uh, studying music in college. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's skip a few chapters forward in the textbook here. Um, the next piece I wanna show you here is uh, about a really key concept in music, it's called timbre. Uh, so timbre can perhaps best be described as the color of sound. Um, it's what makes a flute playing a B flat sound different from a trumpet playing that same note. Um, and timbre can be a difficult concept to kind of wrap your head around and develop an intuition for. Um, so uh, what we've done here is we've used what's called the Web Audio API, one of those new and interesting APIs that I talked about, um, and some dynamic visualizations built right there in the browser um, to, to help explain that better to students. So at the core of the concept of timbre is variations in the sound wave that, that is you know, generating the sound that you hear for any given note, and the way that sound wave is built up from a bunch of different component sound waves called harmonics. Um, and what we see here is um, the web's ability to analyze a sound in real time and two different visualizations to help teach you that concept. So first we're gonna graph the sound wave, you know, actually the, the wave that you'll hear as it's playing in real time. And then we'll also graph a frequency analysis of that sound um, so you can kind of see those two juxtaposed. So here's the simplest sound wave there is. It's just a simple sine wave. Right, and you'll see a peak on the spectrogram at the single frequency that that wave is, is at, and you can see the simple, you know, very uniform sound wave above it. So we can stop that. On the other hand, take a look at a trumpet playing that same note. See how many different spikes there are on the, on the uh, spectrogram? Each of those is a harmonic. They're really densely packed, there's a lot of them, and the waveform of that trumpet is really jagged and kind of all over the place, very different from that sound wave from the sine wave. A flute, on the other hand, 
there's just a few harmonics. They're really distinct. And the sound wave almost looks like a sine wave. It's really simple, right? There's not as much complexity to that sound. Um, you know, it, it's that, that's what makes a flute a flute and a trumpet a trumpet. And it's, it's really helpful to be able to visualize that and see that while you're listening to the sound to, to connect those dots and connect that concept. Um, again, we can make it interactive. So this is an interactive that lets you say for each of those harmonics how prominent you want it to be in the resulting sound. So here I'll, I'll try and make it sound like a flute by matching what we just saw. Not the best job, but it's kind of flute-ish, right? Um, so you know, this is a really fun uh, you know, way to kind of, again, explore this concept of timbre, and you can lose yourself in this for 15 minutes, kind of moving the sliders up and down, and can you make it sound like a trumpet? It's a, a lot of fun to, to play with. Um, and again, it's not just about playback. It's not just about clicking around. We've got new, interesting input modalities, too. Um, so in this case, what we can do is uh, actually sing back to my computer right, and analyze my voice in real time. So you know, there's a lot of different ways to describe a sound. It can be round or you know, hollow. It can be flat. It can be scratchy. It can be nasal. And uh, you know, if you uh, try and make your voice sound like each of those ad adjectives, you can see how it reacts in the spectrogram. So let's take a look at that. Here, I'll turn on recording audio. Here goes. Pretty fun. Um, so, you know, again, <laughs> thank you, much appreciated. So, um, you know, again, you, you can uh, really connect the dots on what these things mean so much more when it's, you know, it's almost tangible in your hands, right? Like waving the baton around, singing into my computer. I'm going to remember that much, much better a week from now than if I just read a little chunk of content about it. Um, all right, so let's go one more example here in our music textbook. Um, and this is you know, exploring what becomes possible to us when we're not just talking about rich media and we're not just talking about these input tools, we're also talking about a networked textbook. Right? This is a completely new thing. You, you can't have a, a networked print textbook that connects me and all of my classmates over the web. So what can we do if we have a networked textbook? Um, what we're gonna look at here is a famous piece of music by an artist called Terry Riley. Um, the piece is called In C. And NC is a really interesting uh, experimental piece of music where he just wrote out 53 short musical phrases and he says to each performer, play these as many times as you want and move on to the next one anytime you want. That's basically it, <laughs> really, really simple. Um, but what that does is it makes every performance of NC unique, right? Because each, each performer is making their own decisions about when they want to move on to the next phrase. Um, so the only way to really learn about NC is to play it. I mean, if you just listen to a single recording of that piece, you're not going to really be able to understand what it's all about. Um, so what if I could play this live with my classmates in real time over the internet? Let's look at that. So down here, we've got our own little interactive NC player where we can start a performance. So let's, uh, let's say start. You can hear we got a, our metronome, and we can jump into the performance and choose when we want to move on to each of those next phrases. We can also add in some robots if we want to play with some robots. These will just randomly choose to go on whenever they feel like it. And you know, we could sit here and kind of explore this piece and go through all 53 phrases. Or we can head out here and actually join in with some friends of mine who I happen to know are already playing this piece right now. So we can, we can sync up with them, and here you'll see these parts will move along when they choose to move along over in North Carolina, where I'm from. <laughs> so you know I can join in, so this blue guy at the top just appeared on their computers. And again, we can play this piece together over the web. Really, really cool, um, and all made possible by, uh, by EPUB3 and the, the open web platform. All right, I should move on before I get stuck. <laughs> Too much fun. 
All right. Um, thanks. So where, where was I here? Five minutes? All right. So now let's, let's flip the script, right? Once we've got these kinds of really powerful mind-sized chunks of content, how can we get the most mileage out of them? Obviously, it's a lot more work to make one of these than it is to just kind of export a printer PDF and throw it on the web somewhere. So how, how can we get a really you know, strong ROI out of this content and, and get a lot of reuse and remixing out of it? Um, you know, at Vital Source, our answer to this is a technology called LearnKit. Um, I'm running short on time, so I won't go into this too, too deeply, but the beauty of LearnKit is it lets you take that content and use it wherever you like, right? You don't have to build all of the kind of platform technology that you'd have to build to be an e-learning provider. Just use our analytics, use our DRM, use our note and highlight syncing, use our, you know, all of that uh, kind of boring behind the scenes stuff, and you control the user experience and build whatever student-facing technology you want. That's kind of the, the, the beauty of LearnKit. And I'll just kind of roll quickly through a few examples of what, what you can build with LearnKit. Um, the first one is this presentation. So <laughs> all of these examples I've been showing so far are actually part of an EPUB 3 book, which is ingested into our platform, and I'm rendering out into this presentation using LearnKit. So you know, here's another piece of content that, that looks much like our examples here, but we could look at that same content through our bookshelf e-reading platform which has notes and highlights. It has the ability to search the full book, navigate via the table of contents. And every piece of functionality that you see here, we've built with LearnKit, right? So you could build that exact same experience on your own. Um, let's you know, take a quick look under the hood. What I've done here is I've, I've labeled a few of the functions that'll pull back a, a really important piece of content or data for you from that LearnKit API. So you can say, get me the table of contents, get me this user's notes and highlights, render out page five to the screen. Those are the kinds of functions that LearnKit exposes to the browser. And you can use that to build Bookshelf, or you can use that to build Storia, a completely different user experience focused on a completely different market, but much more appropriate to the kind of K through five audience that Scholastic was looking to, to market their product to. So it's, it's really flexible. Um, you also obviously don't even need to use it to build a complete e-reader, right? You could use it to build a presentation, or you could use it to build a simple kind of content snippet viewer, right? So here's that same page that we looked at in Bookshelf a little bit uh, ago. And what we've done is we've truncated it down, again using LearnKit, to just this particular chunk of content, which maybe you want to display inside of a courseware platform or inside of an adaptive learning tool to say, hey, you got question six wrong, here's the exact right chunk of content that you need to get back on track. Right? You don't want to overwhelm the student with a lot of bells and whistles and features. You don't want to overwhelm the student with a thousand page textbook. You just want to get them where they need to be um, and, and help them uh, remediate themselves and get back on track. So again, using LearnKit, you can build that as well. And then the last example I want to show here of, of LearnKit is that um, it's not useful just to students. It's really useful to instructors too. So this is a tool that, that we built that's called Bookshelf GPS that allows instructors to kind of layer on a, a layer of interactive um, question-driven content kind of on top of and around a textbook. So what you can see here is a video of an instructor authoring some of those activities. Again, this authoring environment is built using LearnKit. So we've pulled in the book content on the left right here within this kind of snippet panel, and I can copy-paste material over it in the activities, I can even drag and drop my notes and highlights. I can drag and drop any of the figures from the book. And it makes that kind of question authoring experience dramatically faster and easier for a faculty member. Um, on the student side of this experience, when I take one of these questions, and if I have any trouble and I, I need to take a look at the book to, to you know, figure out what I'm, I'm missing, um, I can quickly toggle back into the book and back and forth to the question experience you know, really flex flexibly and quickly. Um, Again, because we, we've taken this content, blown it up into pieces, and, and kind of pushed it out into that learning experience. So, um, you know, add all that up, right? You know, I've showed a, a kind of a, a whirlwind of demos here. Um, you know, add all that up, and this is the kind of flexible um, environment that's afforded to us by the medium we're working in. Um, it's a completely different medium than, than print. It's a completely different medium than PDF. It's even a different medium than something like a simple, reflowable text book on a Kindle. Um, 
you know, we can support reusing simple content chunks, building complex learning applications, building e-readers for different markets and verticals, um, and much, much more, all wrapped around the same source content. And that content can be far removed from a print textbook. Um, we can use audio and video and visual media. Um, we can leverage new input and interaction modalities. Um, and we can build integrated collaborative experiences, all baked right into our books using EPUB 3. Um, we can be really far removed from simply applying technology to our old instructional methods. So this is what will enable us to break free of the world of paper under glass textbooks. Um, it's a really exciting time to be building this kind of thing, to be working in, in books and browsers and working in education. Uh, I'm really excited about where we can all go together. Thanks.